Good morning, everyone. Good to see you all, hi Zoomers. We'll start with the four quarters chant again this morning, which is in the chat for everybody. And if you're in person, it's on page 30 of your chant book. And if you're new to this chant, it repeats itself. So it's easy to follow. And the little uh, hash marks indicate going up a tone or down a tone. But you'll catch on as people go, as people chant. And if it doesn't sound right, it's just what makes it more beautiful. So just go for it. Now let us make the four boundless qualities shine forth. I will abide pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with loving kindness. Likewise the second, likewise the third, likewise the fourth, so above and below. Around and everywhere, and to all as to myself, I will abide, pervading the all encompassing world with a mind imbued with loving kindness, abundant, exalted, immeasurable. Without hostility and without I will abide pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with compassion, likewise the second, likewise the third, likewise the fourth. So above and below, around and everywhere, and to all as to myself, I will abide, pervading the all-encompassing world, with a mind in the compassion, abundant, exalted, in without facility and without will, I will buy her baby one quarter with the mind and view with gladness. Likewise, the second, likewise, the third. I fly the floor, so above and below, around and everywhere, and to all of us to myself. I'm a little body, her baby, all in the first world, with a mind and youth, with a gladness. Abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without will. I will abide, pervading one corner, with the mind in you, with equanimity, likewise the second. Likewise, the third, likewise, the fourth, so above and below, around and everywhere, and to all and to myself, I will abide, pervading the all encompassing world with the mind in you. 
Finding a comfortable enough posture for the body to remain in for the next half an hour or so. Finding some capacity to be easeful, restful in the posture. It's not a demand of the body in any way. But given this body the way that it is, is there a capacity to be restful with it? And notice what happens when we find some degree of ease with the body. Does it support presence or get in the way of presence? And with this capacity for ease or rest or relaxation, there's still energy to practice. And energy to make adjustments. In some moments, we might feel 
the sense of wanting to control experience, to control the body, even to control the relationship to the body. And that doesn't have to be a problem once we notice that. Naturally, the mind will loosen up a bit. Or perhaps we just notice the possibility of a lighter awareness, a softer presence, gentler, less demanding. And in the same way, if there's a tendency to want to be sleepy or apathetic, we might just keep remembering there's this body, sweetie. And it feels like this. As a way of stirring interest in the present moment. Balancing ease and energy in a way that feels right for each of us right now. Perhaps it's even possible to table that thinking for later. Is it urgent? Is it possible just to rest in a simple, ordinary awareness? Connecting with the way it is, resting, making any adjustments that support presence, resting in presence. Continue in silence now.
Take a minute to stretch your legs if you'd like. Brave Minnesotans <laughs> venturing out into this cold weather. Yeah. It's good to see everybody here this morning. Good to see all of you on Zoom, too. And hello to those of you who are listening in on the live stream. My name is Shelley Graf, and I'm one of the guiding teachers here at Common Ground. And I'll be leading many of these Sunday morning practice groups over the next few months, along with our sharing that role with our wonderful Dharma teachers who you will also see from time to time. All of us filling in for Mark while he is home, taking care of himself and healing, getting a little bit stronger these days, so that's good. And if you're interested in seeing him, um, he and I will be leading a program tomorrow night. Mostly he will be leading a program tomorrow night, but I'll be there and we'll share a little bit of the, a little bit of the evening together. But he'll be talking a little bit about his illness and what, how he's been practicing and what he's been learning and just a nice opportunity to uh, meet with him directly and hear a little bit from him. So it'll be virtual only since he'll be home and uh, still, still pretty seriously immune compromised. So it's good for him to stay out of crowds for a little while longer. Well, maybe, maybe well, depending on how you define a little while, a couple months, a few months maybe at least. Um, so do join in on that. There's a should be a Zoom link on the calendar already. And every couple of months, it's good for us to teachers to talk a little bit about how Common Ground operates. So I would like to just give a little uh, explanation about that. Uh, Mark and Win, Mark Dunberg and Win Fricky started Common Ground 30 years ago, amazingly, uh, back at, at their home, just some blocks east of here. And from that time on, we've always been operating on the practice of generosity, which means that everything is offered freely in that spirit, right? completely, wholeheartedly a free gift. And we should all receive uh, everything in that way. The building, you know, the teachings, the space, every time we come, just to take it in as a, as a real gift of generosity. And of course, it's not there's a cycle of giving and receiving happening. Without all of the volunteer support and financial contributions, we wouldn't have this beautiful place or uh, the retreat center in Wisconsin. And folks do everything you can imagine around here. You know, volunteers support this beautiful center in every which way. So Tom Borden is here this morning doing program hosting. Lucy is online and will help organize everybody into small groups and folks clean and sweep and uh, clean the bathrooms and Madeline and Joe are leading the children in there. You know, it's just like a beautiful kind of coming together of humor. We just are always a part of that, right? No matter how you take it in and how you practice giving and receiving in your own way, you're already a part of it once you step in the building, yeah? And if it feels right, you can, you know, decide to be here sincerely. And that's a real gift to everybody that will come after you. It's a gift to the people in the community here today. And we'll, you know, sometimes I will just kind of feel into the energy that's around and has been around for 2,600 years, actually, practitioners through Asia and all over the world doing exactly what we're doing, coming together for the Dharma. And it's a beautiful thing to be a part of. And so your sincerity with your practice is a gift, right? It's a gift. It's both a giving and a receiving, receiving all of the energy from all of the people who have forwarded these teachers, starting with the Buddha, 
and then offering that back to yourselves and others who will come after you. And if you'd like to volunteer to help upkeep the center or help with the audio processing or anything else that might need to be done, you can talk to me after this program and I'll help you uh, get connected with Gabe Keller Flores, who is our operations manager, and he can set you up with a, a volunteer role for yourself. And if you'd like to make a financial contribution, I will put something in the chat right now for you on Zoom. And there's a link in which you can make a donation. And there's also a bowl in the lobby, a beautiful bowl that was carved by one of our community members, uh, Cecilia Schiller. And you can just, there's a hole and right in the middle. You can put your little contributions in there. There's also a square terminal that you can make a financial contribution that way with a credit card, or you can do that at home too. But if you have questions about any of that, don't hesitate to ask me or Tom, who's program hosting this morning, or there are also many leaders in attendance. Jillian's been, been here for a long time. Cheryl's been here for a long time. Just if you've been around for a long time, raise your hand. Long time meaning a few months or more. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so a lot of people to ask questions to if you, if you need some. So I'd like to talk a little bit this morning about, what do I want to talk about? <laughs> about desire, yeah? And desire in relationship to renunciation. Desire gets a bad rap in Buddhist circles. Right. I think mostly because we, we don't understand, I think, exactly what it means to be a human being who has desires. Right? Desire itself can be like ethically variable, right? Desires can be useful in terms of making our lives. It's, some teachers would say it's the animating force of our lives, right? That which keeps things going, our, mot our wholesome motivations, right? The motivations that we have to take care of ourselves and participate skillfully in community and the kind of wholesome desires to want to set in motion a new habit or to go to therapy or to get sober, like all really wholesome desires, right? Wholesome motivations. And there can be unwholesome motivations, right? Like the desire to have everything we want, right? And at all costs, right? And we can see how desire in and of itself kind of can get a bad rap because all of the challenges that we have in our world are in, in some way related to our unskillful relationship to desire, right? The footprint on the earth, not seeing that we're in relationship with one another, that we have a responsibility to listen to and attend to a variety of needs among us, to hear other points of view, to understand them, right? To feel in contact and relationship with the earth, and the earth body, yeah to understand our own responsibility to participate with the earth in skillful <laughs> ways, make decisions that are in alignment with what's wholesome. And so we don't want to do something weird like to be a good practitioner, I have to somehow set down all <coughs> desires. Like that would make us weird. Right? And in fact, the Buddha understood this, <laughs> that understanding desire is, is a tricky thing. and understanding renunciation in relationship to desire is a tricky thing. Right? Often the Buddha would teach about generosity before he would teach about renunciation, for example. Right? He would teach about sila or uh, our ethical conduct before he would teach about uh, renunciation. And I don't think these things are so far off, actually. I think the Buddha was brilliant course we don't need me to say that <laughs> but when talking about generosity for example there's a kind of letting go that's happening when we're generous right when we give and receive freely we're setting down the heart's inclination to be transactional to be stingy to be self-centered right so there's a kind of renunciation or a letting go that's already happening when we decide that we're going to practice generosity, for example, right? 
And the good news is that there's no right way to do that, so that we, each, we actually have to take it up as a practice, right? Just like at Common Ground, we don't offer suggested donations because everybody's circumstances are different, right? What's right for me is not right for you. It's just all going to be variable. And when we practice with that, we, we have to do the work of looking inward to see what is this all about here? We have to be good students of desire, right? So that we can understand well, what actually feels generous, what actually am I setting down right now? Yeah. And our ethical conduct can be the same way, right? We can think about it in the same way. That when we decide how we want to move about relationally using our bodies and our speech, what kind of values do we want to uphold? You know, then we have to decide what we don't want to do also, right? And we have to practice living in alignment with the kind of values that we think are going to be beneficial to ourselves and each other. And that's not, also not straightforward. Right? So talking about uh, desire and its relationship to renunciation, right? And the Buddha's interest in meeting us where we're at, like, okay, humans, everybody, I, I know what it's like to be an ordinary human being, and it's tricky out there, right? And we even come to our spiritual practice in hoping that teachers will just tell us what to do, right? Just tell me what to do. But that's like creating an unwholesome habit in relationship to desire, too. I want something. I want to do it right. You tell me what to do. I'll just do that. Or I have a personality that's a bit aversive. You tell me what to do, and I'll decide what's wrong with that and figure out what I need to do. <laughs> Could be that, too. But in either way, it's not really owning our responsibility to practice and understand desire, which is what the Buddha was really interested in, right? Understanding what's moving, what moves this heart, and how, we, how do we train in sensitivity and intimacy so that we understand what we're setting in motion, so that when we're making decisions, we're not deluding ourselves about that, right? This is from Ajahn Suchito. He said, desire is an eagerness to offer, to commit, to apply oneself in meditation. Desire, I forgot a word. Desire as an eagerness to offer, to commit, to apply oneself in meditation is called chanda. It's a wholesome kind of desire. It's a psychological yes, a choice, not a pathology. In fact, you could summarize Dhamma training as the transformation of tanha into chanda. So tanha is what we might call craving, right? And chanda, one way to describe chanda, is this wholesome desire, this desire to be of service, this desire to be, of, to be skillful, right? to contribute something that's beneficial. Tanha, in contrast, is this kind of compulsive, greed, greedy energy to attain something, right? So we want to like look at desire from all vantage points and everywhere our lives align with one another, with ourselves, right? Be willing to look inside and see what's moving this heart, right? So if we were to say like, oh, desire is bad, yeah, we would skip over all of that. We would skip over all of that learning. And in this way, we find that letting go can be joyful. Why can it? It doesn't make sense sometimes to say that. But I think it can be joyful because we know that good feeling when our hearts are aligned, when we're, we're sensitive, when we're orienting you know, to what's moving our hearts, to feeling how our hearts are attuning to our values, how we, we feel in relationship to one another. And in those moments, like, the heart is really, the heart's connected, it belongs, it's inclusive of everything that we feel, right? And in those moments, the heart isn't acting out its unwholesome tendencies. So that joy comes from this ability to be connected, to include, to belong, right? We don't necessarily see that because our minds are sort of caught up in this way of thinking that's about like, how do I get what I want? And how do I avoid what I don't want? 
And we bring all of that into our spiritual practice too because that's just how we are as human beings, right? We are these creatures that are always trying to get what we want, right? I mean, and we get bored with the things that we have and we want other things, right? And that's such a slippery slope. I was just watching this in my own mind that uh, when I, okay, I'll just tell you the truth. <laughs> when I go away to teach a retreat on my way home in the airport, I often buy myself a latte. <laughs> oh, no. I know it's not the worst thing you could do, but here's what that, you know, it's fine to have a latte and we're all going to have the things that we want and there's nothing wrong with that, right? We have to be a student. But what I was seeing in my mind is not just a latte when I come home from leading retreat when I'm in the airport, but now it's like a latte. I was just noticing this yesterday. I want a latte and I want to buy it somewhere, right? And I don't just want to buy it somewhere, but I want to buy it from my favorite coffee shop because they roast the best beans. And I want it to not have any, I don't really like a lot of foam. And I want it to be the right heat, right? And if that place isn't open, do I actually still want it? Right? You know, like this is, this is it. This is how the mind is, right? When the, with the unwholesome kind of desire that animates our lives in ways in which we're always trying to get what we want, right? So it's not the latte itself that's a problem. In fact, I want to be able to enjoy every latte that I have, right? <laughs> and actually not think it's going to make me happy at the same time. And not forget to be a good student so I see all the ways that the mind is scheming to try to get the next thing or to make it better, right? Or to make it better. <laughs> <laughs> So we have to be an ordinary being who has an appetite, who has desires, who has preferences, like wants things that are pleasant and understands what's unpleasant and, and what that unpleasantness teaches us because sometimes the unpleasantness is really useful, right? It teaches us what, what we need to avoid for our own health and safety, right? We're not rejecting any of our ordinary humanness when we practice renunciation or letting go or when we practice cultivating healthy desire. We're not also trying to be that kind of perfect student of Buddhism that pretends that we're not any of that, right? We have an appetite, we have sexual needs and urges. We are those human beings, right? So how can we be good students of these energies and urges that flow through us and and learn what we can learn that helps us make the choices that we want to make in our lives. Right. One of the, the traps of wanting a better latte, <laughs> right, <laughs> is like how, how uh, smooth and easy it was for that better to creep in, right? It was, at first it was like, oh yeah, this is a nice, a nice gift to myself, I've, you know, done a good thing, I practiced, you know, did the best that I could for these people and for myself, and I'm really happy about being able to serve in this way. And yet, that slow creep of like, I deserve this, right? And now I'm a person who deserves this latte, right? And me, being a person who deserves a latte means I also have to be the person who isn't satisfied with life as it is, right? Who hasn't sat isn't satisfied with what I have. Is that true? Well, if I have to be a person in some way, that's, you know, have to accept both, right? So the Buddha talked about three kinds of craving. We would call that craving. Like the wholesomeness that, like, to have a, a desire to just want to give a good Dharma talk. Fine. But to be a person who has to give a great Dharma talk and not a bad Dharma talk, probably not the most wholesome kind of desire in the mind, right? So three kinds of unwholesome desires are the, the just that incessant wanting mind, right? The mind that wants and schemes and tries to get and tries to avoid in every which way, wants to think better thoughts or have something that tastes better or have exactly what I want and a little more salt or a better relationship, wants to keep 
improving all the circumstances to perfect them, right? That's a, a kind of desire. And the kind of desire of wanting to become a person who's good at these things, right? Who's a good practitioner, who's a good, not just that being good, but perfecting, like that tightness of being a human being, that becoming, right? I want to be this person who is exceptional in this way, or just better than someone else in this way, right? And also the opposite of that, that being a kind of person who wants to get the hell out of here, right? Because I know that too. Just as easy as I want to have a latte, I also want to be a person who doesn't want to make any choices, right? In fact, I'll avoid all lattes and everything from a coffee shop to be the person who doesn't have any needs, right? Have you known that? I was on, I told the story once before, but I really saw this play out on a retreat that I was on uh, for about a month at, at the forest refuge and it moved what I was noticing is while doing my yogi job of all things, right? I've actually got so much learning from over the years. But noticing like how I wanted to be good at that yogi job and how that slipped into wanting to be good and better and now wanting someone to notice how I'm good at this yogi job, right? And like walking away feeling proud at having done such a good job. And then how that tips, how it feels so incessant. The mind is like just doing that. And how now I want to get away from being someone, right? And so I know what I'll do. I'll set down all desires. I'll get weird with desire, right? <laughs> and I'll try to get rid of everything that I feel desirous around. Like I know I won't take any food that I want to eat, right? I'll just take the things that feel eh, neutral about. Or I won't take any dessert. Well, that doesn't actually help me be a good student of desire at all, right? That just helps me get weird with the, with the activity of what's animating our lives. So we want to be able to watch and discern and feel those desires move through the heart and mind so that we can make some decisions about, oh yeah, is this useful or not? Am I cultivating the kind of living that feels like it's going to be onward leading, that's going to be beneficial, that's going to be helpful? to myself and others. There's a, a story I heard another teacher tell about, well, in the scriptures there's often references, lots of references to place, and there's a place in India that's regarded as Vulture Peak, or it was in, in the Buddhist scriptures, and it's still a place where people pro pilgrimage to and sit uh, just to feel the energy of that. Right, just to be there in that historical significance. And Dharma centers have that kind of pull also, right? There's something about, even about com this place here in the city center or at Common Grounds Retreat Center that we can feel the, you know, the good energy, the good wholesome exploration that's happened in places like this that keep calling us back, right? Like, oh yeah. And many of us will have this notion, oh, I know, like, I'll actually practice if I go somewhere to do that, to be around in community with other people who are, who are practicing like that. But that sort of sh can shake up our ideas about, like, uh, about getting and attaining anything, right? So there's this place, uh, Vulture Peak, in which one of the Buddha's students, Sariputta, his right-hand man, the student who is foremost in wisdom, there's a lot, he has a lot to offer in the scripture of Sariputta. And the Buddha and Sariputta are walking along this place and they come a, across a, a person who, a wandering ascetic, and the Buddha stops to give this person some teachings. And as the Buddha's teaching directly to a person, like given the person's circumstances, responding to his questions, Sariputta is just behind the Buddha fanning him with a, with a leaf, right? And it said that you know, as Sariputta was fanning him with the leaf and just receiving the teachings that the Buddha was giving to someone else, right, he was just relaxed enough to really take it in and he became fully enlightened in that moment, right? So I love the story and I keep returning to it because it really shakes up my idea about what I have to get, what I have to attain as a practitioner, you know? Even those notions about why we go to places, like to attain something, but yet to just be relaxed enough to be a good student 
and to receive whatever is offered and however it's offered. But setting down those ideas about, you know, I have to I have to reach perfect concentration in 15 minutes or less so that I feel the breath all the way to the pelvic area and back up again seven times, you know, without missing it at all. You know, and then I'll I'll feel like I'm a good student. Anybody have? It's just my own notion, or any of you with me on that, right? And we have all these other ideas about what it means to be a good student. But to to practice renunciation is to practice setting down those transactional habits that we have with everything, right? Like instead of coming to get, we're just coming to learn. Like I'm really going to study. I'm going to notice the instincts and urges that arise in this heart. Like every time there's a noise in the Dharma hall or a noise in my home where I'm practicing, I'm going to watch. What does the mind do with that, right? Do we condemn the person, the noise, the judge? Do we judge it harshly? Or do we just go, yeah, I'm a human being. I'm a human being who has needs and desires, the desire for quiet, the desire for things to be like I want them to be, the urge to get up and move or to tell somebody about themselves or you know, to find a better place to practice where the conditions are just right, right? You know, this is just life, right? So we get these opportunities all the time to see what we don't see, right? How about the, the views in our minds, right? That, rep, that point back to the desires that we have, the wholesome and unwholesome, right? Do we have a desire to be right and to be associated with people? Do we read only the kind of political articles and new stories that reinforce how we think, right? Or do we challenge ourselves to hear and see, listen to how other people think, right? To know what it's like to be them, right? And to watch the mind that gets attached, it goes, oh yeah, no, that's not right because I'm right. And I actually feel good about being right. And that's why I want to associate with people who I think alike, because then I'll feel better. I'll, I'll be the person who thinks in the right way, right? Ooh. That's personal, <laughs> and hopefully it feels real to us all, because that's how, that's, it's those kind of movements of energy that actually animate our lives. And this is from the Buddha. He says, I do not say that you can attain purity by views, traditions, insight, morality, or conventions, nor will you attain purity without these. But by using them for abandonment, rather than as positions to hold on to, you will come to be at peace without the need to be anything. I love that. And we don't even have to know what that means all the way through, right? Because there's a lot there. I do not say that you can attain purity by views, traditions, insight, morality, or conventions nor will you attain purity without these. But by using them for abandonment rather than as positions to hold on to, you will come to be at peace without the need to be anything, right? Without the need to be a person who needs to be somebody or needs to not be somebody, right? And so the only thing we actually have to do is just to keep watching, to cultivate sensitivity, enough sensitivity of heart that we begin to see. Right? What is this like to be a human being right now who has ideas and beliefs and views and wants and needs and urges and tendencies to act those out and sometimes acting them out, sometimes feeling good about not acting them out and fantasizing about what a grand person I am because I didn't do that. Right? this also from the Buddha. Whoso has turned to renunciation, turned to detachment of the mind, is filled with all-embracing love and freed from thirsting after life. So we can have this wrong understanding that somehow letting go is uh, about relinquishing the things we want. 
But when we think about renunciation differently, like we're setting down our, our need to be somebody in any moment, right? That's the attachment to desire. We're actually learning to be a student of desire instead of having a transactional relationship which we're always trying to be somebody around desire. This kind of renunciation actually aligns us back with the heart that really cares, right? And is taking radical responsibility for what it sets in motion. And this heart is a heart that says yes to everything. The function of love is to include. That's the function of metta, loving kindness, love, care. And so when we're willing to include all that it means, everything, you know, <coughs> being a human being is like this, when, we're, when we actually include all of that, then we're in alignment with love, right? Then our hearts are being animated not by these weird relationships we have to desire, but by love and care. Well, isn't that good news? <laughs> isn't that what we want? I mean, I don't know what's going to shift our world or my life even in the most useful ways, but I do know that love never hurts, right? It always feels like a good move, right? That kind of caring quality that's willing to be touched by life, yeah? And that takes on so many forms, right? from the kind of lightness of awareness, that's a kind of love, to the kind of depth of compassion, like, oh, this really hurts, it hurts, it hurts to feel this pain, it hurts to be in touch with another's pain, right? From the kind of love that's willing to appreciate life, right? And that what we have to make us happy, to keep us happy, to keep us going, the kind of heart that's gladdened by another person's good circumstances, another person's good fortune, good qualities. And also the heart that's willing to, to be uh, benefited by wisdom. Right? The heart that's willing to not neglect the pitfalls of desire, right? And to feel the heart's attachment to desire and to be really willing to study that. That's wisdom, right? That goes, oh, sweetie, even this is nature. Right? It's just a naturally occurring phenomenon, this unwholesome desire that's moving the heart, and this instinct or this inclination to want to be a person around it. Right? That's what we might call equanimity, like the heart that's, that's not trying to run away from that. So renunciation is not about loss. We don't get to do this or that, but a choice, what we don't get to do, right? But it's a choice that opens up a more spacious heart, deeper and wider, in which there's less discrimination about that which doesn't belong, right? Less discrimination, discrimination about that, but more of like an instinct just to include, just to say yes. So when we're practicing with that instruction to relax when we're meditating, it's not like we're letting ourselves off the hook about something. We're actually leaning into wisdom that understands something. Like, oh, sweetie, without this relaxation, we won't really understand that heart that doesn't need to discriminate, right? The heart that really, that deep desire in the heart to include, to belong, to feel connected, that's alive right here in the spirit of relaxation and ease. Because we'll start to see, right? In the meditation, hopefully we saw a little bit about what moves us into those unwholesome desires. Like the desire to wanna, I know, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna do this my way, right? You ever notice that? Or uh, I, I can't trust relaxation, so I'm just gonna keep striving. I'm just gonna keep really trying to control the breath. I'm gonna, keep forcing my way into the body even though what feels right intuitive is to relax and maybe take a more spacious view right because there's so many adjustments that we need to make in order to orient back to what's wholesome and if we just try to pin it down and strive and control and get cultivate that unwholesome relationship with desire we're just never going to see any of that play out but when we relax and we trust that, oh, this movement of life, this energy, this relationship to experience, oh, this is actually the way that it is, right? There's wisdom 
right there that helps us include that helps us include everything, right? And then we and then we become really good students, right? Students who don't have to pretend that we are any particular way, but are we really willing to know how it is. Okay. Well, the children are here, so thank you everybody for listening.